So in the last video, the acoustic resonator, I discussed the mechanical and electronic design of a transducer, which could convert electromagnetic waves into sonic vibrations strong enough to move massive objects. In this video, I will discuss the amazing mechanics and quantum mechanics of the vibrations themselves. Acoustic waves result in multiple modes of vibration. One mode is longitudinal and in the direction of propagation. This usually results in what is called acoustic lubrication, in which the vibrations reduce the contact between the vibrating surfaces, thus significantly reducing the friction coefficient. It's not weight reduction, of course, but the result is practically the same. If the vibrations reduce the contact between the surfaces by 50%, then the coefficient of friction would also be reduced by half, which would effectively be the same as reducing the weight by half, at least from a pushing or pulling perspective. Another mode is the transverse mode, in which what are called Raleigh waves, or surface acoustic waves, also known as SAW, which by the way also have a longitudinal component, cause surface particles to move in a manner similar to water waves. These waves can carry an, an object in contact via frictional force as shown. Now these particles traveling in wave-like fashion are, are what are called phonons, the quantum mechanical description of vibrational motion. Phonons are considered quasi-particles in that they only exist in matter through which they travel as a consequence of vibratory motion and cannot independently travel in a vacuum as photons of light can. Since heat is a function of molecular vibration, then the photon can also represent heat as well as sonic vibration. Perhaps even more interesting is that calculations, preliminary calculations and experiments have suggested that phonons also carry what is called negative mass. In other words, sound vibrations as phonons move in upward trajectories against gravity and deplete mass as they travel, causing a small amount of the material through which they travel to experience a type of buoyancy as a ball in water or a hydrogen balloon in air. This concept is still in the theoretical stages, but if it could be proven practical in principle and concept, it could have astonishing implications not only for enhancing modern technology as we know it, but it could also lend credence to accounts both ancient and modern of the use of sound vibrations to cause heavy objects to levitate, or at the very least make them easier to lift and move by weight reduction. So what would happen if we resonated an object with enough sonic energy? Could the sound waves theoretically grant levity to the medium through which they travel? Is this property, as well as the technique of acoustic lubrication, the actual sources of the concepts or accounts of overcoming gravity with the aid of vibrations? It may also seem that bombarding an object with such power might also cause the material to disintegrate or shatter, like the familiar glass goblet experiment. And indeed, some accounts of sonic levitation or levity also claim that the very same techniques and instruments used to levitate can also be used to disintegrate, as noted in the account here in Tibet, as well as accounts reported by Keeley. The following article mentions the aforementioned calculations that sound waves transfer small amounts of mass as they travel through mediums. Calculations of this effect have been performed by a few scientists, including Angelo Esposito and his colleagues. It also mentions that physicists had once widely accepted that sound waves carry energy and momentum, but not mass. A rather curious assumption, given that it is generally accepted that anything that does carry energy and momentum, such as electromagnetic waves, can curve time and space, just as mass does. Hence, it would be logical to assume that sound waves would also possess this property, however small it might be. Another document here reiterates Esposito and his colleagues' findings that sound not only has a gravitational mass, but that such mass is negative. 
all known matter has positive mass and such masses attract each other as shown in Newton's law of gravitation. However, negative masses in the case of sound waves are repelled by the positive mass of the earth rather than being attracted by it. Hence it follows that sound waves or phonons traveling horizontally in a standard material will tend to follow an upward bend or curve under earth's gravity instead of a downward curve such as a thrown ball according to Esposito. He also deduces that sound waves of negative gravity should attract each other. Now this is particularly interesting in light of accounts of John Keeley's demonstrations, particularly in, in regard to his weights and jars experiments, in which he claims that the force which levitates or attracts the weights up through the water is the same sympathetic attractive force which holds the planets in their orbits or of course what we call gravity in effect echoing the concept of the music of the spheres the music of the spheres regards proportions in the movement of celestial bodies to each other as a form of inaudible universal or celestial music today we will recognize this concept as orbital resonance which occurs when orbiting bodies exert regular periodic gravitational actions on each other usually due to the periods being related by small integer ratios or harmonics but going back to Keeley's demonstration in activating the resonator at the top of the jar with a resonant mass chord of the weights this causes the weights at the bottom to also resonate at that very same mass chord so it would seem that we have two sound waves attracting each other sympathetically or we could say gravitationally but the question is how much energy does it take to generate this force according to this document one watt of sonic power for one second in air is equal to 10 milligrams or 2.2 times 10 to the negative fifth pounds of gravitational mass one watt, watt second being equal to a unit of energy of one joule thus to generate a force of 20,000 pounds or 10 tons will require an energy of 909 million joules an enormous amount of energy however Keeley reported certain frequencies of vibrations which might greatly assist in the generating of enough energy via resonance so rather than attempting to generate the energy by brute force the energy could instead be built up over time if the alleged Tibetan levitation account shown here is any indication this development of energy over time would make sense as it is mentioned that it took several minutes of continuous sound for the levitation to even take effect according to Einstein's E equals MC squared energy and mass are interchangeable but as we all could also see and deduce it takes a considerable amount of energy to convert to even a small amount of mass in the case of sound waves negative mass and the equivalent negative gravity there are some additional interesting properties of sound in addition to the hypothesized negative mass and gravity the following document discusses a relationship between sound vibrations and magnetism. Modeling sound vibrations as phonons, as previously mentioned, experiments have shown that magnetic fields have an effect on phonon phonon interaction within matter, causing them to vibrate more vigorously and to collide more often. So the question is can intense phonon activity generated by vibrating materials at their resonant frequencies create? a greatly increased magnetic field and since we know that magnetic fields can generate electric electricity and vice versa then we can deduce that if molecular vibrations can interact with magnetic fields then they might also be able to interact with electrical fields if this vibration derived magnetism is true and it's certainly the evidence is certainly pointing in that direction then it would lead credence to the claim that John Keeley was able to cause a compass to revolve simply with acoustic vibrations. He allegedly also caused 
an object to stick to the underside of a resonant structure as said here. Although this, although this was more likely due to sympathetic attraction than to induce magnetism in non-ferrous objects. If sonic vibrations are indeed a gateway to gravity and magnetism, and hence the unified fields, then this makes even stronger the claims of modern science that vibrations, rather than the particle, is the fundamental property of the universe.